Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the sixth chapter of Galatians. The sixth chapter of Galatians. And beginning with verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will receive eternal life. Just those two verses. We reap what we sow. Now there are five laws that I want to give you on sowing and reaping. I remember we used to sow. We had a little plow and behind the plow was the mule and we'd turn the ground over and then we would come along and sow with a little thing that my father had helped invent to, to help sow the corn or the wheat or whatever it was we were growing. And you sow in order to reap. In China, 2,000-year-old seeds taken from ancient tombs are sprouting into plants bearing tomatoes. It wasn't until they were sown that they could produce when the reaping came. Now the scripture teaches in Psalm 126, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the Bible teaches that when we go out and preach the gospel, we're sowing seed. Jesus said he himself was a farmer sowing seed. He said, I'm a sower, and I sow the seed. Said some of it falls upon hard ground, and the birds of the air come and pick it up, and some falls upon ground, and it takes root for a little while, and then the cares and the riches and problems of this life come in and crush it. But he said some of it falls upon good ground, and it brings forth much fruit, and that fruit also brings forth fruit. That's what's happening here. We're sowing seed here, and it's landing in many hearts who receive it joyously. And five days or ten days later, they forget about the commitment they made to Christ. Some falls upon hard ground. You hear the gospel tonight, and you just walk out as, just as you came in without any movement at all toward God. But others fall upon good ground ground that is prepared by the Holy Spirit and it's going to bring forth fruit and then you in turn will begin to bring forth fruit and you will win people to Christ. They had a survey taken in Melbourne, Australia recently by the university and uh, I had said 20 years ago when we left Australia that you cannot judge this crusade in Melbourne for 20 years. So 20 years later they decided to take me up on it. And so they surveyed the people that had made commitments. Not only did they find that the majority had lasted and had grown and become leaders in the community, but they said it was not only an evangelistic effort that was held, but a great revival took place in Melbourne. And that was quite a statement for them to make. And we have that clipping from the newspaper that I just got yesterday. Hosea said, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. I think that could be true for America. It's time to seek the Lord and let him come and rain righteousness upon us because God knows we are a sinful country. Many people think we're becoming a decadent country. In Psalm 126, 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Have you ever wept for your family members that they might come to Christ? Have tears ever come to your eyes as you watch America on television and see what kind of a country we are? And then the second thing is, if you sow, you will reap. If you sow, you'll reap. It's according to what kind of seed you're planting. The Bible teaches that Satan is a great deceiver. There is a devil. And he's working. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Be not deceived, he that soweth to his flesh, that is to the lust of greed, drugs, sex, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6 it says, A wicked man soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly 
shall he be broken without any remedy. In other words, the Bible says if you sow wrong types of seed in your life, you are going to be destroyed suddenly. You remember Cain, he and his brother Abel, the two first children of Adam and Eve, Cain became jealous of his brother because his brother did what God said to bring a blood sacrifice because God honors only a sacrifice that is blood. That's the reason we celebrate communion or you sac celebrate the sacrament with wine or grape juice or whatever it is, symbolic of the blood that was shed on the cross for you. And all the way through the Bible, it's blood, 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 blood that is shed as an atonement for our sins. And Cain killed his brother out of jealousy and blood was shed. And some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. <laughs> but life doesn't work that way. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, the Proverbs 28 says. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. The scripture says the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Physical death? We're all going to die. 50 years from now, most of us will all be dead. 100 years from now, we'll all be dead in this room and those watching by television. And that's not long. Time passes so fast and the older you get, the faster it goes. You want to reach out and bring it back, but it won't come. You cannot redo it. You can't relive it. But you can start over tonight and from this point on live for Christ. But some of us are trying to cover our sins, but there is no covering except the blood of Christ. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And God has to give you mercy and grace. Grace is something you don't deserve. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve judgment. I deserve hell because I have broken God's laws, and so have you. There's a high price to pay the way you are sowing. An article that appeared late last year reminded us that it was not too many years ago that all the pundits and the so-called liberators were held, heralding the dawn of the sexual revolution. But now that's ended. There are many proofs of it. You can see it behind the sad eyes of those who suffer from sexually transmitted diseases. It resides in the anxious expressions of young unwed women who've been left a child to care for without the support of the child's father. You see it in the standard of living decline in the female headed families whose financial losses accelerate with no fault divorces. The columnist Suzanne Fields writing on this subject says that sex as we know it for more than a decade no longer sells. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with her. But both Ms. Magazine and Playboy Enterprises have fallen on hard times and are now in financial trouble. Thank God. I may be wrong, maybe the information given me is wrong, if it is, I apologize, but that's what I've read. It underscores Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right, but in the end, it's death. Yes, there's a way. The devil is going to point out a way to you and say, that's the way to go. Go after money, go after popularity, go after power. You can have it but you're going to have to bow to me a little bit. You're going to have to cut some corners. You're going to have to cheat a little bit. You're going to have to lie a little bit. And we see so much fraud in the country today, even in the higher circles. And so we see sin everywhere. The results of a disease that we all have. You see, sin is a disease. It's a spiritual disease. And you have to be cured of that disease because all of these outbreaks that we see are only the result of a disease that we have in our bloodstream and in our conscience and in our very being called sin. We were born in sin. The Bible says sin is no respecter of persons. James said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away 
of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We're clearly right now in the midst of a major medical catastrophe, the potential impact of which is only just beginning to be realized. And the eventual magnitude is going to be absolutely enormous. AIDS kills every one of its victims. They have found no cure for AIDS. It kills everyone. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. In Wednesday's Newsday, I think it was Newsday, an article said that driven by drug abuse, the rate of syphilis has increased to the highest level in America since 1949. And we thought we were rid of that with antibiotics. Then gonorrhea has increased so that it has now become resistant to antibiotics. But there's another side to the story. There are thousands of young people in America that live clean lives and chaste lives. And God is helping them and they're surrendering to him. A man in Toronto runs a telephone line called Facts of Life. He plays tapes for teenagers and says that most asked for is entitled, How to Say No to Sex. How do you say no? We don't have any strength within us. We have no power within us to say no. Only Christ living in you can help you to say no. You need supernatural power. And there's some good statistics coming out. Jay Siegel said, the marriage ideal of getting married for keeps and never participating in extramarital affairs is stronger now among university students than it's been in many years. And I think that's right. I think we have a stronger home teaching now than we had even five years ago. I think there's been a spiritual awakening throughout the country that we've been, we haven't been aware of. Gallup keeps reporting it in the Gallup poll that more people believe in the Bible, more people go to church, more people trust Christ than ever before. And it's mostly among young people and then organizations like Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Campus Crusade and all of these parachurch organizations. And then I think the fear of disease is having its effect. Perhaps tonight is the night for you to make a change in your life. Now, the fourth law I'd like to lay down on this passage is ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Ignorance is no excuse in God's sight. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed, the scripture says. The devil sows his tares during a crusade like this. The devil is at work. He doesn't like this, and he will do everything in his power to stop it. Jesus said you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil, and you'll reap hell. And some of us will reap hell. The devil, for thousands of years, has been issuing an invitation to hell to all those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. One man who claimed to have murdered scores of people said that he was possessed of the devil. That was his defense when he came to trial. He said, I was like an ice cube when the killings took place. I didn't feel anything. It was like I wasn't doing the crime. It was like being out of my body. Sometimes as many as 10 in a day, he murdered. In another city, a man went to a high school assembly and machine gunned three people we read about the other day. When the case went to court, his defense said he was overtaken by an evil spirit which took away all his ability to control himself. You see, Jesus recognized that there were evil spirits and he cast them out of people that came to him in repentance and faith. On the cross, he conquered the devil and all of his legions. Yes, there is a devil. The scripture says in 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I would like to say to the devil tonight, you are a defeated 
foe. In 1 John 4, 4 is a verse of scripture you ought to memorize. Greater is he that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. Now the Bible says he's the prince of this world and he's the God of this age. But he that lives in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the devil and all of his power. And then the next law and the last one, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says they've sown to the wind and they're going to reap a whirlwind. Have you ever been in a whirlwind? What a whirlwind can do. Have you ever seen a whirlwind? Have you ever been in a hurricane? Have you ever seen a tornado? Have you ever seen a tornado rip apart a part of a city? It's a devastating experience if you have. Charles Reed wrote a, many years ago, sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Yes, you reap in your latter years even before you go out into eternity. Come to Christ now.